and we turn to Psalm 80 as we prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Rob. That was lovely. If you will all rise and read with me responsibly the call to worship. Come, sing a new song of worship. Come, sing a new song of praise. Today is a day of promise fulfilled. With joy we celebrate Pentecost. Pentecost, a day when power and comfort flowed. Pentecost, a day of hope and inspiration. A day when the Holy Spirit was revealed in flaming glory. And the glory was given to the people. The fire of the Holy Spirit lives on in us. Sing praises. We sing praises indeed. And now we have a chance to do that with Jeff leading us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Good morning. Let's start off our praise songs by singing, He Has Made Me Glad.
time of sharing a joyous testimony. Spencer comes up to help you with this. It's an opportunity to lift up blessings and praises, the great things that the Lord has done. I'll share with you that last week uh, I was able to attend graduation at Susquehanna University. And I had 12 seniors that I've been with for four years and then three others that finished in uh, the fall that all walked. And to see the joy and the, the relief after the weeping and gnashing of teeth of finishing finals and now I just experienced as I've just turned in my <coughs> final project. It was just such a blessing to see those young men and what God has in store for many of them. Of uh, those 15 young men, six of them are going off for advanced graduate degrees and all but one of them have jobs in their fields and I was just blown away in this day and age for that to be happening right after graduation. What a blessing and a joy and I uh, just really encouraged to see what God's going to do with some of those young men. Anyone else? Over to the right. just wanted to say that Haley and I shared our birthday on Fridays, on this past Friday. <coughs> 15, Haley? 15. <laughs> Not 18 yet. <laughs> I'm thankful for answered prayer. Amen. All the way in the back, Spence. Get your track shoes on, buddy. This past week, uh, I actually was able to go up to Milford, PA, which is all the way up in the northeast corner. There was a girl from Germany who lived the next village over from me, probably a 10-minute walk if I wanted to, and I got to visit her this week and speak a little German, which was really nice, because she's doing an exchange at Delaware Valley. Cool. Anyone else? Greg, get your hand up. All the way up front, Spence. Somebody in the back, get ready so we can make them don't come back with you. <laughs> um, yesterday, I played with my lacrosse team in a tournament, and we got first place to end off the season. It's a little bittersweet. He's been with those boys ever since he's come up here. He's played four seasons or three seasons with them. His first year, we, and he's it's been really neat to see them come together. And, uh, Coach Moan's son's on that team, and they're got pretty good camaraderie. I think there's some young men that he'll stay in touch with even after we depart. Anyone else? Any other birthdays, anniversaries, celebrations? Majesty.
she, she, like, I looked at my wife, and I made eye contact with her. <laughs> but uh, many of you are aware that she's a uh, frequent flyer, Miles at Guy Singer, and we know the third floor, and everybody on the third floor. And we even know the secret elevator to get in, in and out so we don't have to go around front and we can shorten our travels. Well, she just looked at me, she said, I can see, which uh, is incredible because it's better and improving, and that's what we've been waiting and believing for. Because uh, last week, Mr. Impatient here, any, any, any impatient folk in the house? I was like, next time you see Dr. Marks, tell him it's time to schedule the surgery because we can't wait any longer. And Dr. Marks talked to me off the cliff, talked to her off the cliff, and said, no, give it one more week. It, it may, might clear up. So uh, that's the first time you've been able to like see something in at least three weeks. So praise the Lord. And we give God all the glory for that because we've really, there's a lot of people been praying and believing for that. So at this time, I invite the children forward. We have children's time. Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Good. You all look like you planned this because you all have black and, and um, white and pink. All but you, Chase. You're the rose between the thorns today, buddy. <laughs> and purple. So I have some questions to ask you today. And I want you to listen very carefully. <coughs> if it takes 20 minutes to hard boil one egg, how long does it take to hard boil two eggs? 40, 40, 40. 40. 40. No, the answer is 20. <gasps> yes. It doesn't take any longer to hard boil two eggs than it takes to hard boil one egg. Okay, so that was kind of tricky. So here's the other question. A farmer has 15 chickens, and all but nine of them run away. How many chickens does he have left? Nine chickens. How many? How many chickens? Yes. How many? Nine. How many does he Well. It was 15, but the answer is nine because I told you that all but nine ran away. So I tricked some of you, didn't I? I did Yes, I did. <laughs> so do you ever try to trick anybody? Uh, yeah. yeah. Has anyone tried to trick you? Yeah. Yes. Sometimes tricks can be mean and sometimes they're meant to get somebody else in trouble. Did you know that some people tried to trick Jesus? Yeah, they asked him questions so that he would get into trouble. Did you know that? People in Jesus' day were required to pay taxes to the Roman government. And that was not very popular with the people. So one day, a group of religious leaders came to Jesus and asked him if he thought the people should pay taxes. Do you know what taxes are? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they were actually trying to trick Jesus because they knew if he said yes, the people would be angry. But if he said no, he would get into trouble with the Roman authorities. So Jesus saw right through their plan and he did a very smart thing. He asked them for a coin and he said, whose picture is on the coin? And they answered, it's Caesar. And Caesar was the ruler, and all taxes had to be paid to him. So Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. So look what I have. Who's on that coin? Who is that? George Washington, that's right. And what does it say above the picture? That's right. Very, very good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So I guess that means that this coin belongs to George, right? Yeah. He was our first president. Mm -hmm. That's a quarter. So I guess we'll have to use it to pay taxes whether we like it or not. It came from South Carolina, thank you. <laughs> but what about God? Jesus also said, give to God what belongs to God. And the Bible says that we were created by God and that we were created in his image. So if we are created by God and we were created in his image, we must belong to him, right? So that means, what do we have to give God? Ourselves. Ourselves, that's right. We have to give ourselves to God. So let's remember that. Let's have a prayer. Dear Lord God, help us to give you what is yours. Help us to spend our hours in acts of love and our days in doing acts of kindness. And may we always obey you and give you the praise that is due. Amen. As the children are dismissed, if you have prayer cards, you can pass it to the center aisle. Friends will collect those, and I'll share the request from Sunday school hour. We have uh, prayers for Pete and Karen, uh, who the husband is on hospice, for Joni Sitko, for Retta, who's 91 years old and now in a nursing home, to Joy at pregnancy list Patty, Kim, who's recovering from surgery, Betsy, who has skin cancer surgery on June 7th, uh, Kyle Harmon, the athletic director from my high school, his stepson's in ICU right now in Tennessee um, from a heroin overdose. He's, they're hoping to get him off the ventilator today, but the prognosis is not good as far as brain activity and uh, long road ahead of them. Jaden, who had surgery on Tuesday, Awanda, who also had surgery on Tuesday, uh, music camp, campers are needed uh, for Kylie and for Rick, um, for Vane, for Mr. and Mrs. Mays, for Kim and for Carol, uh, for Barbara Carpenter, uh, families who lost loved ones on the Egypt air crash, and please be in prayer for our denomination, United Methodist Church. They just wrapped up annual conference, or general conference, which was out in Portland, Oregon, and um, it was a very difficult time with a lot of uh, hotly contested discussions and holy conferencing, and uh, I'm sure you can read more about that as it's publicized. What a lot of the, they didn't make decisions about a lot of things. So we just need to pray that people work together and work towards building the kingdom of God. Whether whatever side you believe on certain certain hot button topics, we just need to be about the kingdom of God. Amen. So any other requests that we need to lift up before we go boldly before the throne of grace? Let us go to the throne of grace. Eternal God, we count an honor and a privilege to boldly come before the throne of grace. And we thank you for your promises that you'll provide all of our needs according to your riches and your glory in Christ Jesus. So, Lord God, you have heard the many needs and the requests that have been lifted up. And we thank you and we stand on your word, Lord God. So, Lord God, for those who are in need of a physical touch, we thank you that there's healing in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name. 
So, Lord God, we just pray blessings over those who are recovering from surgeries and those who are waiting results. We pray that you give them peace in the midst of the storm. And we pray that you would guide and direct the hands and feet and the minds of those who serve in health care. Let them look towards you as their source and their strength and let them glorify you with the gifts that you've given them. And Lord God, for those who experience loss, we pray blessed are those who mourn, particularly the victims of the tragic airplane crash. Comfort those, Lord God. Comfort those who have experienced loss. And Lord God, we lift up the United Methodist Church and we ask that you would be glorified, Lord, that they would look towards you as their guiding source and that you would have your way in Jesus' precious and holy name. And let us now pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Who would like to select a hymn today from the congregation? I already selected mine, so I'm out, I'm out of luck. Buzz? 177. One? 177, Christ, excess, majesty, worship. And what is, what is that one? He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. One, him 177, he is Lord. We'll go through this two times. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be able to present back to you your tithes and some of our offerings, not just of the money part, but also of our hands and our feet and our goodwill this week. In Christ's holy name, we pray. Our scripture today comes from Acts 2, verses 1 to 21. Please bear with me as I attempt this. Don't fall asleep. Remember, I used to teach. Okay. I'll wake you up. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and he began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Nix far? No? Okay, I told you I'd wake you. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who were speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the 11 and raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This ends the reading from the scripture. Thanks, Bray. Now, I'll confess that this is not Pentecost Sunday. Last week was Pentecost Sunday. Did anybody know that? A few of you did. Good. And you might remember that I often share that this is the most forgotten holy day in our Christian calendar, particularly in modern society today. And I think that Pentecost Sunday should be one that's right up there with the two high holy days where the CEOs come out, Christmas and Easter. Amen? But I think that the church should be more packed on Pentecost Sunday than any other Sunday because on that first Pentecost Sunday, something happened. And we see in the text today as the Spirit of God descended in that moment and people stood in amazement as they heard the message in their own native language. Now, 
as we move forward through the message today, I'll eventually land the plane with a tune, Send the Fire. And this is not a new praise and worship song. This is actually a recording from over 20 years ago when we had one of the more modern day revivals, which Diana and I trace our spiritual roots to, which was the Brownsville Revival at Brownsville Assembly of God in Pensacola, Florida. And at the time, I, don't, I can't remember which video I picked. I think I just have uh, words. You're not going to see the pictures of people with bad hairdos and a lot of plaid and some leisure suits, so we're not going to have to endure that. We'll just have the words and the song up because there were some really bad hairdos at the Brownsville Revival. Amen? But today, let me fast forward. Right now, as I stand before you, there has been a modern-day outpouring in West Virginia. Is anybody familiar with what's going on in West Virginia right now? That's what I expected, because the news never publishes things like many people getting saved and people turning from their wicked ways and people desiring to live righteous and holy, and there's multiple churches in this pocket of West Virginia and a lot of students. It's been really, this has been a student-driven Revival because it's mostly high school and college students is where it birthed. It was birthed through a youth ministry at a church in West Virginia. And people are lined up around the buildings and going to church every day of the week. Now, when was the last time the church was used every day of the week for worship? I mean, churches get used a lot, but a lot of times they're used for self help groups and they're used for meetings and business meetings and other things. But these churches are actually having worship services every day and this has been going on for almost a month now and i've been following it because anytime something like that initially gets publicized a lot of times there's um sensationalism and there's you just gotta you gotta chew on chew on it a little bit and spit the bones out you, you follow what i'm saying that that we need to to let the word and let things that god's doing kind of settle in our spirit and we need to use the gift of discernment to discern what's of God and what's of not. Because there's a lot of people, and we can go through the scriptures and look at people who wanted the power of God, but they didn't want the godliness that went with it. And we could use Simon the sorcerer as a good example when Simon the sorcerer came to them and said, I want to be able to do those things, but I don't necessarily want to be able to do them in Jesus' name. I just want that power. And then you got, got to be careful about this whole sense of mysticism and new age and some things that might have a resemblance of godliness, but no power within. So now I'm going to take a trip back for a little bit, and then we'll dive into the text. And we're going to kind of go on this rabbit trail, and hopefully, through the power of God, we'll all have a fresh desire and a hunger and a thirst for more of God and be a little more sensitive to what the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And back to our roots. The logo in the Methodist Church has that, that red thing. What's that red thing? The flame. What's the red thing represent? The fire of the Holy Ghost. And guess, history lesson here, all the modern the original four cornerstones of the modern-day Pentecostal movement, which dates back to 1906, Azuzu Street, all date themselves to a Methodist layperson, Brother Seymour Bridges. A lot of you didn't know that, did you? So you guys are the roots and the heritage, and then I could even... If I went a little deeper, I could show you the traces where the UBs and the EUBs were all part of that because there were people from those backgrounds because you didn't become United Methodist till anybody know what year you became United Methodist? Very good. Good history lesson. And I, I, the history here, and I want to share some of this, you guys have taught me so much in four years and caused me to dig deeper into some of the church history roots that it's been such a blessing being here because it's encouraged me because you guys have the strain that came in in 1968 that was a little more grounded in the work and that when the EUBs and the 
Methodists came together in 1968, you guys hold sacred and high authority scripture. And I just want to commend you and bless you and encourage you to never, ever get away from that heritage, that always be people of the word. And I share that to say this. It's so important, particularly when we see modern day moves of God, that everything that we see lines up with the word of God. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And yes, we might see new little foreshadows or things where God moves and new creative miracles, but everything we see should line up with the Word of God. So when you see something that's way out of bounds and doesn't seem like it lines up, and maybe you have a check in your spirit that, oh, that's not right, I'm going to let you know something. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, it may not be right. Amen? And that's okay to, to poke holes in it. And there's an author that I would encourage you that has really been a challenging author to me, Lee Strobel, and he's done a series of books. He was an agnostic, self-proclaimed agnostic, who his heart's desire, and the reason he wrote all these books was because he wanted to poke holes in Christianity, and he has the case for the creator, the case for faith, the case for the Bible, and there's, I think he's got six different books that are the case of books in there. They're not long. They're small, thin paperbacks, and especially engineering types and analytical types, you'll really dig it because he writes like you think. Amen? John, you'll love it. Right in your wheelhouse, brother. Ted, right in your wheelhouse. Like, you'll, you'll read him and you'll go, ah, because not everybody thinks that way. Amen? You guys are a different breed, but I appreciate you. I'm a little more touchy-feely. I'm a little more emotionally driven. You analytical types got to be black and white. We, got, we definitely have some black and white folk in Clark's Grove. Amen? A lot, not a lot of gray areas sometimes. Amen? But I want to encourage you, as it's Pente we're going to hear about Pentecost Sunday and look at what took place then, and then move forward to say that if God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that we still need a modern-day Pentecost. In the text today, the Holy Spirit came, and they were together in one place. And right now, we're together in one place. We're together at Clark's Grove United Methodist Church. We're here to worship the living God. We're here to receive all that God has for us. And then in the midst of it, a suddenly happened. Boom! It sounded like blowing of a violent wind that came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, let me let you in on something. If we had a sound like a rushing, mighty wind right now, and the speakers popped and the wind, windows shook, what would be everybody's first response? I'm listening. I'm hearing some murmuring. Your first response isn't the Holy Spirit came. You're thinking it's a natural disaster. You're thinking it's judgment. You're thinking a whole lot of things. But you're not thinking that the power of the Holy Ghost came, correct? Are we all, are we all I'm going to go, you know that the disciples were Honda fans. They all were one of cord. Some real bad Rob type humor there, amen? They were all, all of one accord. Well, they were of one accord here on the day of Pentecost because they figured it out. They were like, something happened. And you know what? I'm going to confess. I understand contextually. In four years of serving up here, we're a little wary of something happening. That we're kind of, we like to go the direction we're going and something different might, might stretch us a little too much and we don't, we wanna, don't want to step too far out of your box and for four years you've endured something too far out of your box, which is me, amen? And, and I'm not going to stand on any pews today, Gene Miller. You're not going to have to have the big one. But I am feeling lighter and feeling like I could jump up on the pews again, amen? But when something happens and when God does something, you're going to know it. And see, in this text today, and I want to commend Deb. She did a great job reading through one of the more challenging texts. And, and outside of this text, unless you're doing lineage, which is not read from the pulpit as a liturgist very often, there, there's not 
that many decks that have that many difficult words that you got to kind of mutter through. And my dad had one of those difficult texts a few weeks ago. He's often a lector in his Catholic church, and he called me up and wanted to go step by step through all the difficult words. And I said the same thing to my dad that I said to, said to dad. Say it with confidence, say it with speed, and nobody's going to know the difference. Amen? But in this text, they heard, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. And I want us to, for a moment to put ourselves in the text. I asked you, and we're a little interactive today, I asked you if the windows started shaking and there was a rumbling and, the, and things happened, what will we respond? And guess what? You confirmed it. There would be some bewilderment. There would be some thinking of what's going on. And our first response would not necessarily be that it's the power of the Holy Ghost. But in our roots, we got the flame. We got the fire of the Holy Ghost represented on everything that's United Methodist. However, in many cases, that's just history. It's not today. And I believe that that is one of the challenges of the church today is that we need to be historians and we need to get back to our roots and we need to desire a move of God like we've never seen. And that through the power of the Holy Spirit that people can be transformed. That we can have belief for that young man like Kyle Harmon who's battling and they're not sure whether he's ever going to be made whole again through the power of the Holy Spirit. God has the power to raise people from the dead. God has the power to still heal. If he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he still heals. He still delivers. And at the end of the text today, it ends with, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I want to encourage us that some of us might have a loved one that's wandering or not walking with the Lord right now, but stand on the promises of God. Stand on your roots of the Word. Stand on the things that if you raised a child in the admonition of the Lord, they will not depart from His ways. Now that's a good promise, amen? That's the Word of God. That's not Pastor Billy just running his lips and running around like a crazy man. That's the Word of God. And the Word of God is Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Logos, the Word. The Word became flesh, and we have the Word right before us. We are so blessed as people to have what we have before us, and sometimes we take it for granted. I know I'm not the only one who's ever been guilty of that, amen? And you know what? When God quickens you, and it happened a couple times this week because I talked to Matt McGinnis a couple times on the phone and through text this week. And I've known Matt a long time. And him, him and his wife, Lauren, are just great people. And he's, they love the Lord. And they've been battling this thing with Kyle for 10 years now. And watched him with his struggles and his ups and downs. And when mom called out because Kyle had moved to Tennessee about three months ago. And everybody was like, that might not be the best idea for you, Kyle. They, they weren't real big fans of the girl that he was going down there to be with. And, and moms, dads, you know when your sons and daughters aren't with the one that you think they should be with. You get that kind of grinding in your spirit. and You're, you're just kind of taking a step back and you're, you're waiting and hoping for the best. But that mother's intuition that you know that you know that you know. Well, Lauren had the mother's intuition. And mother, Lauren's a woman of prayer, and they go to Sunrise Church, which is a great church outside of Ocean City, Maryland, and I love Pastor Darrell and a lot of the leadership in that church. And, and Lauren, on Thursday, and she talks or texts to her son a lot because she's the mother who's concerned about her son. Well, didn't hear from him on Thursday. So she... After fretting and going back and forth, she finally broke down and she called for a welfare call. And of course, the police knocked on the door, found him. He was fine at that moment, but he snapped. He was so upset. Mom, you don't trust me. Anybody ever witness this when, when you get a, a teenager or a young 20-something that thinks they know it all and there's like friction and tension, amen? I watched my wife go through that. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, I don't envy you. And Bray, 
Please don't ever put us through that. <laughs> it, it is coming. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> so the next day, she woke up, and she was really distraught, Lauren was, and she talked to Matt. And Matt, Matt even called me Friday morning, um, and I said, Matt, you got to just let your wife do her thing because she's going to do it whether you tell her not to. Like, this is one of those times where you can't stop her. And I didn't actually find out about all this until right after worship last Sunday. Um, there was messages on my phone that they had driven down to Tennessee, and they were with them and asking for prayer. And I had a bunch of texts that popped up on my phone during worship last Sunday. They sent for another welfare call, and praise God, the police found him, and he, had, he was out at that point. And they drove immediately down to Tennessee, where he was, and then they were able to get him moved over to the ICU in a better care facility in Nashville. And so now a week has gone by, and he's still on a ventilator. Um, he's able to make eye contact and follow him. He's able to squeeze on command, but they're still in that waiting mode, and they've done all kinds of scans and tests, and medical people know more about what goes into reading brain activity. But they're still believing for a modern-day Pentecost to come to Kyle, and that this could be a defining moment for Kyle. And see, I love this text today where they all heard in their own language, and you know what? Each of us has our own language. We all speak English. We might speak Coal Region English, which is a different version of English than I grew up with, amen. But some of us might speak Philadelphia English, or some of us might speak Balmerese like we do, or some of us might speak, speak Pittsburgh where you yin's a little more, but they're all dialects, but they're all of the same language. But we hear differently. Some of us hear in the quiet through reading. Some of us hear through people. Some of us hear through signs and wonders. A lot of you love because of the area and the region that you live in can see God's creative hand in the seasons and in the changes in the weather and in the cold region. If you don't like the weather, just hang out. It'll probably change. Amen? Uh, and last week I experienced that on the Eastern Shore where bodies of water can radically change the weather patterns in an instant and go from beauty to devastation. But you need to know what language or what, how God speaks to you and then flow and operate in it. So then they have this perception, oh, they had too much wine. Now, I don't know about you, I've been around some college students in my lifetime and it's pretty obvious when they've had too much of the fermented vine, amen? And I've had them when they've just recently been dumped and call me and they're all crying in their empty container because they're all distraught. There's a difference between being drunk of too much wine and being filled to overflowing with the Spirit. And in the Korean church, and I witnessed it a few years ago at annual conference when we had a Korean bishop, they do this thing called Son Ki dough. And it is one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced. But if we did song key dough here, you would all be freaked out because it's everybody praising God however they want. And sometimes it goes on for extended periods of time. But let me let you in on something. When you sit in there, when the Korean Methodists practice song key dough, it sounds like a language out of heaven. And it's never rehearsed. It's just spirit-led. And it is beautiful and glorious, and it sounds like a heavenly choir. Now, I know I'm in Clark's Grove, and if I tried to challenge you to practice Song Ki Do, and I had Bonnie get up there and tickle the ivories like she's so gifted at, and we, we would probably sit there like this. And there wouldn't be much Song Ki Do. Because it would be out of our norm. And that's not a bad thing because that's, how, that's the language that you hear God in. You prefer the quiet place. You prefer to be in your secret place of devotional life and prefer to be in the quiet place. But I want to let you in on this text at the end, the last few verses. Verses 17 through 21 is... 
Peter, post-Pentecost Peter. Now we know pre-Pentecost Peter, what was Peter known for? Opening mouth and inserting foot. Post-Pentecost Peter, empowered by the Spirit of the living God, filled with the Holy Spirit, addresses the onlookers and immediately goes back to Joel chapter 2 and quotes Joel 2 in the last days. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And I don't know about you, and I'm not a big end times guy like, get ready, get ready, get ready, because there are some preachers that have built whole ministries on get ready because he's coming, and I believe the time is nearer than it's ever been. But nobody knows the days of the hour, and I still think that God needs to do some things to fulfill all of his promises. Amen? So we don't need to live gripped with fear. Fear being the opposite of faith. And faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. And just like Kyle and Matt are believing to see Kyle raised up, we desire to see some things happen in our nation and in our world. And God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still heals. He still delivers. He still saves. We need a modern Pentecost where God pours out his spirit like being poured out in West Virginia right now. We need a modern Pentecost right here in the coal region where people would say yes to the things of God and no to the things of this world. And we need a modern Pentecost that breaks the chains of addiction, the bondages of addiction, the bondages of depression and oppression and things that don't honor God that are part of societal norms and they've become our norm. But sometimes we don't like to talk about the things that become our norm. And the reality of it is, is if we're honest and transparent with one another, we've all been affected by things that have taken place. And your roots are so rich here in the coal region, but the coal region's not the coal region of 50, 1950s or 1960s where the church is the most important and influential building in each town. But if God pours out his spirit, and in the last days pours out his spirit, People can be healed. People can be delivered. God can raise up a mighty army where your sons and daughters prophesy, where young men will see visions, where old men will dream dreams. And even on my servants, both men and women, pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Now, people get all weirded out when they hear words like prophesy or they think that, oh, I'm not a prophet. Well, let, remember back to our teaching. I did a whole series on spiritual gifts. Prophesying is really just this. It's speaking the word of the Lord. And prophecy should be more about edifying and building up and encouraging and building one another up. And you all have the ability, because there's a lot of people with a Barnabas spirit, the gift of encouragement, where you can speak words of encouragement. Let your tongue speak life, light, and blessings. And that's operating and speaking and prophesying. And then what happens? I'll show wonders in the heavens, signs on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And then we have the ultimate promise. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's God's heart desire that people would say yes to him and no to the things of this world. Bible tells us that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but these long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That that's God's heart. That God desires relationship. God desires people to say yes to him and no to the things of this world. And that God desires to be glorified in everything. So as we hear the teaching, we, we started all the way back with the roots of the Pentecostal movement, and I'll end with the founding father of Methodism, John Wesley, and his Pentecostal experience. There was a time when John Wesley was on a boat coming back to the United States, and he was with a group of Moravians, and on that boat, his testimony was his heart grew strangely warmed. Now, prior to that, he was already an Anglican priest, 
We all know that the influence that Susanna Wesley had on him, he was definitely a mama's boy. Him and Charles were mama's boys through and through, and it's okay to be a mama's boy. I'm a mama's boy. Any, any other mama's boys in the house with me today? Some of you need to sign up for a counseling session. That's okay. He was a mama's boy, but he was on that boat, and he was talking about the things of the Lord, and he's, in his journal it said his heart grew strangely warm. And I, after much research and talking to a lot of Methodist historians and theologians, I am convinced without a shadow of a doubt that that was like a second blessing, like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He, was already, he already loved Jesus. He already knew Jesus as his Lord and Savior. But something happened on that boat. He had a suddenly where his heart grew strangely warm, and he had a deeper hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And that's a modern-day Pentecost, is that our hearts grow strangely warm, that our hearts don't get cold and hardened, but our hearts grow strangely warm, and we desire more of God in everything that we do. So in a moment, Eric's going to push play, and the words of the song will be up, and and I'll be honest with you, this, this song, this recording actually is probably from 1996 or 97. And this was kind of one of the hallmark songs of the Brownsville Revival. And that was one of the more modern day revivals where there was just such an outpouring. And there's still remnants of that revival that go on to this day. So Heavenly Father, I just thank you that we could look at your word we could understand that Pentecost is for today. It's not just an event that happened over 2,000 years ago, but that your heart's desire is that you would pour out your spirit upon us and that we would desire more of you, less of ourselves, and that you would be glorified in all that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's focus on the words as the song, Send Your Fire.
God, send your fire. Send your fire to the coal region. Pour out your spirit like never before. Lord, we cry out to you today that you would send your fire, that you would break the chains of bondage, that you would pour out your spirit, that we would see true revival here, that lives would be touched, changed, and transformed. Lord, that all those who would call on you would be saved and that you would be glorified in Christ's name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. comes on you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. Go in peace and greet each other with the love of Christ. Amen.